Welcome to the Rotary Club of York. We are a people of action committed to service above self and honoring the four-way test. If you haven't already done so, kindly silence your cell phones. Steve Feldman is joining us virtually and will lead us in our opening song, The Star Spangled Banner, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. President-elect Glenn Miller will offer the invocation and Eric Menzer will introduce our visitors. Good afternoon, Rotarians. Please join me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. Please join me in prayer. From 1 Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for rulers and for all who are in high positions of authority, that we may lead a peaceful, quiet, and dignified life in every way. Let us pray. Gracious God, all authority in heaven and on earth comes from you. We give you thanks today for our system of government in America, which, even with its flaws and weaknesses, holds the possibility of bringing justice and peace to our community and our nation. We're grateful for the dedication of your servant, Seth, and, for, and we pray that you endow him with wisdom, compassion, and a heart for justice and service as he carries out the duties of his office. And let us remember that our unity in you and in your love outweighs any and all human divisions of party or politics. Bless our time together this day, the food we have received, the fellowship that we enjoy. To you, the one God of many names we pray. Amen. So I'm pleased to have the honor of introducing the guest for today's meeting. When I call your name, please stand and remain standing until President Jackie has welcomed you. I'll also say that there is a group of our youth leadership guests who are on their way. I'm going to introduce them anyway, even though they may not yet be here, so you know who they are when they come in. Uh, so this first group are all guests of youth leadership. Sydney Rudisill, Colin Masek, Christopher Rudisill, Rebecca Rudisill, J Jessica Masek, James Masek, Christine Heine, Jean Rudisill, James Rudisill, Mitchell Masek, and Meredith Alley. LaQuinn Thompson is a guest of Service Above Self. Ann Clark is a guest of Service Above Self. David Babode, guest of Walt Tilly, and Norman Hummer, guest of past President John Kleinitz. Can all our visitors please stand? So, so our practice is when we call your name, we'd love you to stand so that we can see you and know you're our visitors and, uh, and then we'll, we'll welcome you. So thank you, thank you for doing that. Thank you for being here. 
We're really thrilled that you're with us today. It's going to be a great program. We hope that you find it informative and interesting and that you'll plan to come back, come back again often. Members, please help me welcome our guests. Oh, you can sit down. Thank you. In November, we will be promoting a challenge established by Rotary International President Shaker Mehta called Each One Bring One. You'll see those table tents on each of the tables. This encourages every Rotarian around the world to bring a guest to Rotary. So in November, we're going to really be promoting that. You're going to learn more about it soon. But please consider a guest that you could bring with you in November. We want to see a lot of people standing and someone that you think could potentially become a member of this club. Today, after the meeting, the membership committee will meet in the old lounge. The IDEA committee will meet on Monday morning, the 18th at 8 a.m. via Zoom. The Rotary Leadership Institute of Northeast America is hosting a seminar for District 7390 on Saturday, October 23rd from 9 to 2 via Zoom. It's a three-part curriculum, and to learn more about it, you can register at www.rlnea.org. Your $25 registration fee will be reimbursed. I had an email from Al Hayes, and he wanted to share that he will be coming home from the rehab hospital on Friday, the 15th. And he's looking forward to being back with us again very soon. I know your continued prayers and well wishes mean a great deal to Al and his family. And now for our member moment. Jane Schusler joined Rotary in 2002. Jody Keller was her proposer. She became a member because she was a frequent guest and always loved the programs as well as the mission and activities of Rotary. She has served on the fundraising committee for the past 10 years and loves to play golf in the fall event. She was also very involved with the Trees for the Trail project. She has practiced law for 46, excuse me, 40 years, 36 of those years with Stock and Leader where she headed the family law division until her retirement in 2019. Over the years, she served as a role model and mentor to other women attorneys and shared the family law section of the York Bar Association, often providing free legal services through their pro bono program. She also mentored high school girls interested in a legal career through the Future Leaders Program of Leadership York. One of the highlights of her career was in developing a collaborative law practice, providing clients with an innovative and less contentious way to resolve divorce issues outside of the courtroom. Upon her retirement, the Women in Law Committee of the York County Bar presented her with the Jane Alexander Award, which is bestowed to a female who has advanced the legal rights of women. Jane also became the first and only attorney to win the prestigious Athena Award. Jane is originally from Richmond, Indiana, and was a political science major at DePaul University outside of Minneapolis. She studied law at Western New England Law School in Springfield, Massachusetts. She worked on Capitol Hill for four years where she was a legislative aide for two members of Congress. She once considered running for office, but after witnessing firsthand what candidates endured during their campaigns, she realized it wasn't for her. She chose law because her dad was a lawyer and she worked in his law office when she was a teenager sometimes in the summers. And if she hadn't chosen law, she very well may have found a career in astronomy, archeology span or geology She's a big fan of science and the PBS show, Nova. She and past president Mike King have been married for 20 years and have five children between them and four grandchildren. In retirement, she continues to be an advocate serving on the boards of Turning Point and Pappas House and is part of the York County Community Foundation Women's Giving Circle. She and Mike enjoy golf, travel, biking on the trail and volunteering. Jane, you are kind and generous, and we're grateful for all that you do for Rotary and the many causes who benefit from your leadership. Let's give her a round of applause. And now, past president Brian Pate, Brian Tate, Brian Pate, Rob Bowen, oh, Rob Bowen, you're right, you're right. Sorry, Brian, hold that thought. This is how fast I'm trying to go. So. Past President Rob Bowen um, would like to talk to you about a special, um, a special opportunity that we have.
Brian, sorry for jumping in there, but on my agenda, it said me next to him. Um, we had a great presentation two weeks ago from Jack Kay about the construction at the Yorktown Hotel. I was able through Kim Hogeman to arrange two tours. Now, the problem with the tours is they're limited to 10 people each. So your reservations will be on a first come first serve basis. And if I get too big of a group, we'll try to reschedule again. The salmon colored flyer shows no, uh, Wednesday, uh, November 3rd at four o'clock and Thursday, November 18th at five o'clock. Uh, please be dressed for a construction site. Uh, no open toed shoes and uh, old clothes would be helpful, uh, but let me know so I can fill up the rosters as quickly as possible. And uh, if we go over that, I'll create a waiting list and let you know. Thank you very much for your uh, attention on this. Sorry about that. That wasn't on my agenda. It got missed. It was a newer agenda that came after. But thank you. That was an important announcement. And I know we have a lot of interested Rotarians who want to attend. Okay, so now for an important Service Above Self Award, past president Brian T. Thank you, President Jackie. And that was a very important announcement. I'm glad to follow you anytime, President, past President Rob. Today, Rotary Club of York continues a long tradition of celebrating an outstanding community citizen with an award named for one of our clubs and community's greats. The Charles S. Wolf Service Above Self Award lifts up the, rot the Rotary motto of serving others while remembering the late Charlie Wolf, who was an early recipient of this award and who embodied service above self. And you can see the criteria on the yellow flyer that's on your table if you wanna take a look uh, at the flyer. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. LaQuinn Thompson is a remarkable young man in our community who constantly looks for opportunities to serve others, to improve the York community, and to provide mentorship to young people. I met LaQuinn when he was a scholarship recipient of York City Dollars for Scholars when he was graduating from William Penn. And I was extremely excited when LaQuinn graduated college and joined the staff of my church to lead the youth center and eventually all of St. Matthew's community outreach. LaQuinn is a young man of faith who provides leadership to other young Black people in York who are challenged by continued racism and bigotry in our community. LaQuinn's secret to engaging young people, meet them where they are, often through gaming. The founder of the Beast Initiative Esports and Gaming Youth Program, LaQuinn is growing esports and gaming by making York a hub for this endeavor. And he and his cohort help youth learn about ever growing career opportunities in the esports industry, focusing on competitive gaming, photography and video graphic design, event organizing and planning, and streaming and content creation. And it was LaQuinn's volunteerism in this area that led to his hiring this summer as the STEAM instructor for fifth and sixth grades at Lincoln Charter School here in York. This summer, LaQuinn received the Alumni Achievement Award at his alma mater, Penn College of Technology, at the 2021 Summer Commencement Ceremony and Rotarians take note for any of you who live in the city of York like I do, LaQuinn stepped up this year to run for school board in the York City School District. And I thank him for doing that. And Rotarians, you already know LaQuinn's grandfather, our esteemed member and friend, Bobby Simpson. Clearly there's a legacy of service to our York community and our African-American community in this family. Fellow Rotarians and guests, Please congratulate our Charles S. Wolf Service Above Self awardee, LaQuinn Thompson. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, recognized with this award. Um, just like Brian said, uh, it's it runs through the family. You know, service to the community is something that we take very seriously in our in our family, um, and we just want to make sure that the next generation understands that together as a community we can make York a better place. So thank you again for this amazing honor. Truly appreciate it.
LeQuinn has chosen for his honorarium to be awarded to the fifth and sixth grade team from Lincoln Charter School, participating in the Extra Life Games on November 6th. That's a huge global online gaming fundraising event to support Children's Miracle Network's hospital. So I think that's uh, pretty cool how this gift will uh, not only um, prop up LeQuinn for his great service to our community, but it's going directly to benefit a wonderful fundraising effort that the young people he's serving are participating in. So LeQuinn, congratulations. Thanks so much. And again, check out the yellow flyer that's on your table. If any of you would like to nominate someone for our Charles S. Wolf Service Above Self uh, award, please uh, take a look, complete one of these and turn them in either to um, our staff or to the chair of the committee, Michael Haiti. Thanks so much, everybody. LaQuinn, we're in all of your success. You're a, you're a perfect Rotarian. So we hope you'll give that some very, very uh, strong consideration for the future. Thank you for being here. Congratulations on this honor, well-deserved. So we are gonna move things around a little bit. We were planning to do students of the month at this time, but they're studious. And so they are finishing taking their PSATs at Your Country Day, and they will be here shortly. And so we will move them to after our program. So please stick around so that you can, you can be here for that presentation. And uh, so now it gives me great pleasure to introduce past president, Mike Summers, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, I still say she's the best looking president we've had. <laughs> All right, I, I will take one second to say that um, the program committee will probably be meeting in November, be my guess, to do the next uh, six months. So this is a great time to just mention that uh, the only way we have great programs every week is because of each of you and your great reach that you have. So if you would please, uh, if you have a good idea that you think our membership should consider as far as programs, please send a uh, email uh, explaining why you think would be a good program to me and or Lynn, and we'll put it on the list for consideration. So on to our speaker today. Once every 10 years, the US Constitution requires a full census of our country in order to reallocate the 435 seats of the US House of Representatives and at the same time redraw the congressional districts. The 2020 census is complete, and while Pennsylvania moved up to become the fifth most populous state, once again, Pennsylvania will lose a congressional seat for the 10th consecutive census, as other states grew more robustly. We will actually have lost 19 total congressional seats since 1920, more than any other state. Texas, growing at just under 16% over the last decade, is adding two seats as an example of the new allocations and theoretically where our seat went. Further, at the same time, redistricting happens to the state's House and Senate seats, which are reconfigured for our representatives in Harrisburg. Our speaker is the chair of the House State Government Committee, Representative Seth Grove. Seth and his committee has been holding hearings throughout the state regarding redistricting, to gain citizen input for these critical proceedings. Seth will help us better understand the process and give us timing and the nuances of redistricting. And Seth has served the residents of the 196th district since 2009 here in York County. He's a graduate of Spring Grove Area High School and holds a bachelor's degree in public administration from York College. He got some York College goodies when he came in today and he has a master's in public financial management from the University of Kentucky. As mentioned, Seth currently serves as chairman of the House State Government Committee, which has oversight over numerous aspects of state government, including elections, procurement, information technology, pensions, regulatory process, right to know and sunshine laws, and the state's ethic laws. Seth resides in Dover with his high school sweetheart, Dr. Casey Grove, and their three children. Fellow Rotarians and guests, please warmly welcome Representative Seth Grove.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. To first point out my York College tie, we have a hearing there later today, and uh, someone's wife, she's very presidential, gives me a lot of grief if I show up in my alma mater not wearing your college garb. So I got it. I got it covered today. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a new committee, standing committee chairman um, for, for the House of Representatives. We do it kind of by seniority. So the longer you're there, um, the, 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 I guess, better committee and eligibility for committee. Uh, doesn't mean it's right, wrong, or even that you're any good at being a chairman, um, but that's just how the process goes. Um, I was chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Uh, we didn't do any uh, move bills out of committee. We actually did legislative investigations, which actually kind of built into what we do. But I thought it would, it would be a good opportunity to kind of overview of what, uh, um, how a committee functions uh, to give you that background because most people think it's just this panel and it's kind of over, but it's a very important role. We were actually the workhorse committee of the House this session. Uh, prior to Ron Marsico, uh, he was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He would do meetings like all the time and run criminal justice bills. I'm surprised we're all not actually in jail by the amount of work they did. Um, but we, we, we definitely became the workhorse committee uh, this session. Uh, most of the bills, agenda items that we do uh, stems from uh, our committee. Uh, 25 members, 15 Republican, 10 Democrat. Um, when your party's in control, you get the majority. Um, and there's actually rules that we vote on to, to discharge. Uh, Scott Conklin is my co-chair. Newly appointed, my other co-chair kind of went to jail recently. Um, <laughs> that's another story if you want to hear about it. Um, uh, Don Kiefer, uh, local representative from York, also serves on, on the committee as well. Um, I might also say uh, the state government committee was the second most requested committee to be on at the beginning of the session. So I'm very, very happy. Normally it's, it's not, but we are. Um, so importance of committees, uh, members introduce bills, um, bills get assigned to committee, bills voted out of committee, brought to the floor. So literally your committees are the inflow to what the entire house takes up. Uh, committee chairs have the ability to move or not to move legislation. Um, and some bills are put into certain committees so they don't move, certain bills are put in committees so they do move, uh, but committee chairs have a lot of uh, ability to move bills. Obviously, they also need a majority vote to move them out of committee, so that's a whole other discussion when you bring bills up because you may not actually have 15 votes or yeah, yeah, 15, 15 votes in your committee to move stuff out. Um, so you gotta work with your committee members as well. Uh, committee, our structure, committee chair, we have committee staff, we have four staff, executive director, general counsel, um, Mike Heckman's uh, attorney on the committee, and then to uh, senior research policy. Uh, I redid how our committee functions because um, I felt um, committees are, are kind of a structure of middle management of the General Assembly, right? You have your leadership pecking order, but they basically run the calendar. They set the agenda within their committee um, and there's certain rules and procedures you have to live by and there's no training like it's hey you're a committee chairman congratulations good luck that's it right um so my goal was to number one create specialization of our subcommittees and utilize them we, we have subcommittees they're never used um which means individuals in the general assembly who are soon to be chairs don't have the opportunity to actually learn what it's like you have to reach sunshine laws you have to uh, make sure you properly sunshine stuff build an agenda work with people uh work through a lot of major issues to get that bill through committee on the floor to make sure it's a working product um that you know doesn't necessarily blow up on the floor you do the best job you can uh but also we have some very technical stuff like pensions very very technical um it's not something you just walk into one day and say hey i'd like to do a pension bill um, it, that, there's a lot that goes into that. So I want to make sure we had have technical experts on all of our subcommittees, not to mention you saw it's 25 members. Um, give a politician a microphone, right? Imagine 25 politicians a microphone. Uh, when you have a hearing, you have a three hour slot to have a hearing, you have testifiers and you have all these members wanting to ask questions. If you have 25 members in the full committee active, it's tough to do deep dive on issues. Committees are made up of six members. You can do deep dive into issues more efficiently and more effectively by using your subcommittee structure than you can your big committee structure. And then you have natural experts to actually do a deep dive and ultimately do a better job for public policy, the residents of Pennsylvania. So um, 
and other committees started actually using their subcommittees a lot more too. It's been, it's been a really cool structural change within the house. Uh, function standing committees, three main things, oversight, move legislation to the floor and policy development. Uh, I was obviously the oversight chairman of the committee. Uh, we focus on bipartisan uh, fact-based oversight. Um, kind of a weird realm with all the partisan bickering. Uh, my co-chair at the time, Matt Bradford, we sat down, we had um, the Levin Center, uh, Carl Levin, uh, former US Senator recently passed away. He was big into bipartisan fact-based fact, like facts, fact-based oversight, facts, you know, actual facts, what happens, what occurred, facts. Um, and it was a really good learning experience because it really helped develop that form of oversight into that committee structure um, and it actually helped really helped out with our election stuff. Uh, uh, our, kind of our regulatory um, and policy oversight, we have Department of General Services, Department of State. Uh, Department of State has all these professional licensure stuff. We don't deal with that. That's a professional licensure committee. Uh, we have the election stuff under Department of State. Human Relations Commission, um, State Employees Retirement System, um, School Employees Retirement System too, Governor's Office, Independent Fiscal Office, Data Athletic Commission. I, I'm the sports guy, it's kind of cool. Um, Independent Regulatory Review Commission, that is boring regs. Very much impactful in everybody's lives, but they're boring. And the shadow government, the Joint Committee on Documents. I bet nobody here has heard of them. One of the most powerful non-known entities in the entire Commonwealth. Um, you'll be seeing a little more from them coming up. Um, so, and then anything else, ask just anything else assigned because it's state government committee, right? Most people think I run the state. My kids actually think I run the state. I don't. Um, but at any time, like you could, a bill could pop up in your committee. Um, leadership calls, we need to get this out. Uh, we have an agreement between the governor's administration, Senate, we need to, to get it out. So that does happen from, from time to time. So there's always that, that little asterisk, anything else assigned to the committee. Uh, so far, we've done 33 hearings, 11 voting meetings, uh, two comprehensive election reports. We are by far the most active committee in the General Assembly. To date, I've done more work than every other committee combined in the House and probably the Senate. Um, we will probably do more work uh, and we're, we're just really getting started. So, I mean, it's we, we've done a lot. Um, I'm really proud of the work the committee members have done and they're, they're active and engaged. Like every single member of the committee is excited to, to be on the committee and do the work and do the deep dive. So we're, I'm, I'm really blessed uh, to, to have the members, both Republican and Democrat. Uh, breakdown of the hearings, uh, we're, we're finishing out 12 congressional redistricting hearings. Uh, we've had seven, we have five more planned, one this evening at your college. We've done 10 election oversight hearings, four COVID-19 oversight hearings, two public pension hearings. They're actually really riveting, like get sleep, have energy drinks, but they're actually very informational. Uh, government waste and proper payments hearing, lobbying disclosure hearing. We'll actually be moving a huge package of lobbying disclosure bills and ethics bills coming up um, probably when we're back in the session at the end of October. Uh, randomization ballot orders, emergency procurement hearing, metrology, calibration testing fee hearing. That was a short one, pretty interesting. Uh, and then we're pre-planning procurement 101, pension legislation, ethics, right to know, term limits and technology disasters. So as you can see, a whole gamut of issues we deal with within the committee. Uh, voting meetings, uh, there's kind of a breakdown and I try to package the bills in topics. Um, so it's just not a random concoction of bills we're moving out. Uh, helps message it and helps keeping people focused on uh, what, we're, what we're doing. Um, so again, you got everything from land conveyance on June 22nd, elections, a lot of COVID-19 stuff, because uh, we are still dealing with that. Um, you know, Lieutenant Governor picked by uh, the governor legislation. Currently, it's elected. Uh, Senator Argyll, uh, my counterpart in the Senate, actually had as a bill that it would kind of be like the governor or the president, vice president, where the president will pick the vice president. Um, so we, we cover a lot of gamut on, on, on different issues. Again, we moved about 44 bills out of committee uh, over those um, hearings, 40 House and four Senate meetings. Uh, as of 10-11-2021, uh, uh, we've had 200, we have about 255 bills in committee. We've moved uh, 44 out, so that's about 70% of received bills. I think we're up to 1,937 bills introduced in the House. 1,937. Typically, we get to about 25 to 2,600 bills introduced on just on the House end. 
but again, we do have 203 house members. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise. We have that many bills rolling out. Um, so I'll, I got to bet a lot of those 255 bills are election bills, both Republican and Democrat. So elections have been obviously a very hot topic uh, in the General Assembly um, by both parties. Uh, two election reports, they're both repgrove.com. Uh, one was kind of an overview of all the legislative action, lawsuits, everything that occurred um, between the in the 2019-2020 legislative session, and then our comprehensive review of Pennsylvania's election law uh, from our, our 10 comprehensive hearings. Back base, facts, facts. I love facts, they're the best. Um, brings us to congressional redistricting. We had two main goals out of committee this year election reform and congressional redistricting. Why congressional redistricting? Because we're mandated by the constitution to do it. Um, we didn't pull out our hat and say, hey guys, let's go redistrict districts this year. Um, you have to do it and they, and they need to complete it uh, before petitions go out. Um, so a little background, I'm gonna read stuff because I gotta be honest with you, um, I'm probably gonna end up in court and litigation next year, hopefully not. The goal of this is not hit litigation. Uh, but I'm going to read stuff and you're going to get a very vanilla description of redistricting um, because what you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. My advice, my attorney advised me to say that. No, um, so you, uh, you're you going to get kind of the, the constitutional background. You're going to get a good overall briefing, uh, what we've been up to and kind of where we're driving all this at, at the tail end. And it's it's some really good stuff. Uh, keeping it back your mind, this is Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is not known for change, right? Takes a little while for Pennsylvania to change. Um, and just because we've done something some way for a number of years doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing something different. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because we're doing something very, 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 very different here in the Commonwealth. Uh, so Article 1, Section 2 of the United States Constitution basically says every 10 years you do a census and then you reapportion congressional districts based on the new numbers. Uh, this year, once again, we do lose another seat. That seat went to North Carolina. I have friends in North Carolina, legislators, they like beer, they like barbecue, and they tell us they like to steal our jobs and their congressional seats. Um, that is something we have to work on as a policy in this Commonwealth moving forward, uh, because that is bad for the Commonwealth. Um, that lowers our voice here in the Commonwealth when, when it comes to federal funding and federal issues. Um, so I joke, but it is a very serious thing. Uh, we need to fix that. Um, it also bases kind of our apportionment of US House census data, uh, public law in Congress um, spells out when the census data will come out. Interesting enough, 90% of people filed online with the census this year. So you may say, why was the census delayed uh, this year? Because more, more people filed online, it's easier to aggregate that data. College kids, college kids was the reason why it was delayed. Most of those college kids were at home. So the Census Bureau asked all the colleges and universities for their enrollment and they reapportioned those college kids back out to the colleges as assuming they would have been there under a normal non-COVID year. So that was the big delay uh, in the census data, which put a lot of states uh, kind of behind, behind the eight ball. Uh, Constitution of, of Pennsylvania, we have a bifurcated process. So congressional redistricts are handled by a regular bill process by the House and Senate through our normal mechanisms. House and Senate state seats are done by a legislative reapportionment commission as spelled out in the um, constitution, which is actually a good thing because um, most people actually don't like any maps that are drawn generally, particularly if we have to vote on our own maps. I don't know if you're gonna get a majority vote of 203 members of the house saying, oh no, I love my new district. Um, so. It's actually a good thing. We do have a commission set up to do that. It's chaired by the four floor leaders of each caucus. So two Republicans, two Democrats. They're supposed to pick someone as the chair. That never happens. So backup plan, the Supreme Court picks it. Max Baer, the Chief Justice, picked the former Chancellor Pitt this year to do that. They are actually doing simultaneous hearings. Um, they've actually kind of been tracking our hearings in the House. Um, so they've been doing a pretty good job uh, holding more hearings and getting more public input as they're developing those maps. Um, so that's kind of a separate process uh, than what we have, but I do want to point out there's a direct difference between state maps and federal maps. Uh, and again, congressional maps is done by a regular bill. So a bill is introduced, put into committee, voted out of committee, put on the floor, floor over to the other chamber, similar thing, and it's signed into law by governor, right? So what's unique this year in Pennsylvania? 
we have a Republican controlled general assembly and we have a Democrat governor. So if you want a map done, there's gonna be a lot of compromise developing that map, which is also a good thing because hopefully that'll alleviate any lawsuits because you can figure if Republicans and Democrats can agree on a bloody map, people shouldn't have to sue over that map and it can just be done with and I don't need to be deposed. It's important. I don't know if there's attorneys in this room. It's not fun. You're mean. No, it's all good. Um, so 10 years ago, I was on state government committee 10 years ago. We did three hearings. We did a hearing out west, out east, and one in Harrisburg. We did three hearings, and we moved the map. The map was a shell bill, um, so it was introduced to the House. It was like literally 18 districts, and there was nothing else. Like District 1 had nothing. It was just a shell bill. Moved to the Senate. Senate loaded that with the districts, came over the House on concurrent vote. It, was, it, it, it wasn't transparent. It wasn't open. Um, you know, uh, People kind of found out what the maps were at the last second. So we sat back and said, how can we do this differently? Because we do have split government. That's not going to work. That will not work again. Uh, we need to work with citizens. We need to work with the governor's office. And we need to actually develop a map that people can be happy with and represent the views of Pennsylvanians. And two, I know a lot about South Central Pennsylvania. I know nothing about Erie. I know nothing. Um, we're up in Wellsboro. I, I hate to say it. Anybody been to Wellsboro, Pennsylvania? It's beautiful. I got lost twice. I got stuck in traffic. That was my experience. But we had a great hearing. But you need that input. I can't say what a community of interest in that area looks like. Much like my, my colleague, Clint Outlet, who represents Tioga County, he, he doesn't know York County at all. So it's important to build that. So we, we drew out a, a, new, a new, basically, plan to completely overhaul how we do congressional redistricting, to make it more open, more transparent, and get as much input from the citizens as we possibly can before we even start looking at how we draw maps. Um, so it's really small. Um, my, my colleague, Representative Wendy Thomas, had House Bill 22. It kind of codified a new transparency process on how to do congressional redistricting. I went to her, I'm like, listen, um, I want to do a trial run on your bill because I don't want to pass something in statute and learn it really doesn't work and then having go back and redo it. Let's pull some of your ideas out and uh, let's, let's, let's do it as a trial basis and see what works. And, and then let's come back and codify it to make sure we get the best possible process for the citizens of Pennsylvania moving forward. So with that, we, we started with 10 hearings. Uh, we have a website, paredistricting.com, um, that you can do a lot of, lot of public input. But our goal was to really flip on its head what we've done in the past and really try to engage as many citizens as we can to build the best maps possible for the residents of Pennsylvania. Um, so here's kind of our redistricting schedule. I got, I got, we were supposed to be, uh, this is supposed to be our last hearing at your college tonight, but they came back early into session. So I had to reschedule all the Eastern district ones later. I was kind of hoping to be done already, but, um, we, we got four more, um, well, yeah, four more after, uh, tonight at your college. Uh, but we started, uh, a joint Senate house Senate hearing, uh, on the delayed census data all the way back in February. Uh, July 22nd, we had Congressional Districting 101. What's it look like? What are your what are the laws governing this? What are the what have the court cases said? Starting from that basis point of facts, understanding what our role is as a General Assembly to drive maps uh, at the end of the day. Stakeholders, what is the stakeholder input on the process we've used in the past? What's a better process moving forward? Ideas, et cetera. And we got right into the regional hearings, Northwest, Allegheny, Southwest, uh, North Central, South Central, Northeast, Southeast, and then the Philadelphia region. I mean, I can't do 67 hearings in 67 counties. Um, so we did the best job we could of trying to break it down into those giant regions and have everybody doing input as much as we can. Uh, the final hearing will be October 28th. And one of the things we, we, we heard firmly is one of the issues people have, have with congressional redistricting is the simple fact that we have one person, one vote. Each congressional district can have a deviation of one person. One single person. So you have 17 districts. Half will have one single person more than the other half. 
State House and Senate districts can have a deviation of 10%, plus five, minus five. Makes life easier. One person is incredibly difficult. So if, uh, and we heard testimony, uh, Butler County, and, and it, it, it poses problems for elections. There's a precinct in Butler County where a county commissioner said we have 17 people out of a thousand in a congressional district. So when they go vote, you need 17 different ballots than the other thousand people. And then they have questions, why am I getting a different ballot? I thought I was in uh, Congressman Smith's district and no, no, you're in Congressman Summers district. So it creates some chaos, but it is, it is that you have neighborhoods split in half to try to get that one single person deviation. Um, so I applaud map makers because that would drive me insane. Um, just to draw it that close, but though that is what we're under. So part of that is to drive home that fact to get in people's minds. Like this is a harder task. Even the, the I'll call it amateur map makers out there will be like, I got it pretty close. I got it down to like a hundred people. Like <laughs> get rid of 99 more. <laughs> one, one single person. The other thing is uh, with the census data out now, we have someone just doing a deep dive into the demographics. What does the data actually say? Where are people moving? Where are they shifting? All of that is building to one thing, the development of a map. All these hearings are engaging people. What do you wanna see in your community? So 2011, the map that was created, York and Adams were together. We had one seat. It's been like that going back to the 1800s. Um, the Supreme Court came in in 2018, uh, moved Adams County to a separate one and split your county in half. Was that good? Was that bad? Um, that's the input we're trying to gauge from communities like York to say, no, we want to be whole. We shouldn't be split or, you know, we should be split more. I want more congressmen. And we've heard from actually county commissioners on both sides. Some like playing off different county commissioners particularly if one's a Democrat and one's a Republican, um, depending on who's got the White House is who they go to. Some prefer one. Uh, I don't want to go. It's confusing. I don't want to go. Keep us whole. Um, so we've kind of heard it from both sides, which is really interesting. Most people say keep us whole. Keep us whole at the county level. Keep us whole at the township municipal level. Keep us whole at school district level. Um, so it's been, it's been really good gauging that public input on what a community of interest is. So website, awesome tool, um, paredistricting.com. You can comment on the current maps. I hate it. I love it. Change it, whatever. Um, you can draw communities of interest. So a little mapping tool, you draw it, click uh, submit, add your name. You can add a description why you think this is a community of interest. You can do like York and Adams together. You can draw York and Lancaster together. I don't recommend that because they're horrible people. No, they're great people. Um, but you can you can say, you know, I think I think, you know, community of interest is, is York City and the surrounding counties. That's our that's our main hub here in New York. You can draw that. It gives you a tool to, to input those communities of interest, who you think you associate with, who you travel with. You know, I, we were talking baseball and sports. You know, my kids play sports. Um, you might think your school district or your where your sports lines might draw is that. Uh, you can submit full maps. That's coming soon, so you can actually submit full maps to the to the committee, so we can review them. You can provide written testimony for the regional hearings, which is still open. So if you really feel passionate after this wonderful speech, you can go home and you can submit written testimony about what you think the York County congressional seats should look like. And then you can sign up for emails to stay informed what's happening. So how's it going so far? You know, this is all new, this is all new. So, but it's kind of cool. Um, Governor Wolf uh, launched a, uh, there's an article about Governor Wolf. He came out with an executive order. He put a team together to help him uh, evaluate congressional maps. And he also did a website based on ours. So, I think that's a pretty cool, like, good job. Um, and uh, there is a litigation. I'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but um, they ended up suing, suing uh, Victoria de Graffenreich. She's our acting secretary, secretary of state. Uh, this was actually in the court filing the Wolf administration made um, in response to that. And I thought it was pretty cool because, you know, using the, that data, the House State Government Committee is soliciting public input on new maps, including by holding a series of public hearings across Commonwealth. 
Governor Wolf is also soliciting the public's feedback and has established a redistricting advisory council to assist him. And basically is there's no indication that the political branches are delaying. They appear to be actively moving the redistricting process forward. Um, so by the work we're putting in, um, we're building, hopefully building a consensus map that the General Assembly and the governor can agree on and we can mitigate litigation moving forward. So what's next? So review the public input we get. You got to draw the maps, release the maps, build the maps, and then we need to do all that um, prior to nomination petitions heading out for re-election prior to uh, February 2022. You know, you always expect litigation. The National Democratic Redistricting Commission, that is uh, former U.S. Attorney Eric Holder uh, group, they already filed suit in states and certain states attempting to bypass the legislative process. And they basically asked the courts ahead of time to, to prevent their, their legal argument is you have split government. They're not capable of drawing the map. So you, the courts just need to step in and draw the maps. Uh, and if there's any attorneys, it's Carol Ann Carter at L versus Veronica to graph and read that. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. And the response, um, that part of the response was in into that lawsuit. Um, and how that's working, we're still working on how, the hard part is the release of the maps, right? Like, it's nice to get input on the map, but people just care about what's the map look like, right? Um, you keep in your call, you know, uh, we have to lose a seat, who's out? I've thrown out the idea of um, having all the congressmen in one of the islands in the Susquehanna and see who survives. <laughs> You have fun. You have fun. Um, so, I mean, we do lose one. Uh, Connor Land, current congressman, is saying he's running for U.S. Senate, so he's vacating. So most people think, oh, you're going to get rid of the Connor Land seat out west. Well, then that might not be true because they've lost population out there. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, and the big thing is we are taking the input from citizens very seriously. Um, one thing I learned very well is Allegheny County is South Hills and North Hills. Uh, ask somebody from South Hills well, how much to go to North Hills. They're going to be like, Ugh, I don't go to North Hills. I ask anybody from North Hills where they, if they, how often they go to South Hills. Ugh, I don't go to South Hills. So if you have a map split Allegheny County between East and West, that's completely against the viewpoint of Allegheny Countyans and their North South split. Um, you don't learn that if you don't talk to people and engage them and find out where their communities of interest are. Um, so that's, that's the big goal. Um, release of maps. We want to do something much more transparent. I don't know what that looks like yet because we're not quite there. Um, so, but we do want to do a more, much more transparent process of maps uh, before they hit the governor's desk to try to vet them. Um, so, questions, and I have some awesome recommended questions. Um, if you can't think of any, so please feel free to pick one of those anytime. Ryan. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the hair one, wasn't it? Was the hair? Hair. All right, we'll come back. Uh, was there? Yeah. First of all, uh, congratulations. Clearly, a better, a more transparent process than that. As a lay person, tendency to uh, litigate that had been hired 10 years ago was such a less transparent process than now. <clears throat> was that in fact true 10 years ago? And if not, why? Yeah, the question was, last last 10 years ago when we did redistricting, why, why wasn't there a high propensity to litigate with a less transparent process than today. Um, the big question, uh, the big reason is the Supreme Court. Uh, the Pennsylvania Sp Supreme Court switched from Republican control to Democrat control. So the lawsuits for the 2011 maps didn't come until 2018, seven years into that, that length of time. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. What's the relationship between congressional redistrict polarization and continued polarization of, of the electorate? Um, it, you're always going to have it. You're going to have your fringes. Um, you know, we, we have a saying like the, the loudest voices are heard the most uh, within the political parties. Your, your um, kind of extreme positions usually scream the loudest and regular people are just kind of there, right? You live your lives. You're like, what are these people doing? Why are they crazy? What's going on? You question everything about your life. Uh, you question how your government has lasted over 300 years with all this. Uh, I will say it's been worse. If you look back in history, it's politics have been a lot worse. Um, as bad as you thought, maybe the 2020 election, there were worse campaigns, presidential campaigns, fascinating history. Uh, there's podcasts on it. Highly recommend you, you, you read it. Um, and that's you know, the, the, the electorate, you know, you have the news media coming in. I mean, let's be honest, the news media reports bad things, right? You never get the good stuff. Most of the bills we do in the General Assembly pass bipartisan. They usually break down on geographic issues. It's not a Republican versus Democrat thing. That's never reported because it doesn't sell ads, right? Um, congressional redistricting has been, it's been a hotbed. I have a, a friend of mine, Phil King, he ran um, congressional redistricting for um, the Republican House for the past two terms. Um, he actually had a DA bring him and charge him with crimes. Uh, and he was deposed by a district attorney because uh, it got so bad down there. That hasn't happened here. And hopefully by doing a better process, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if we get a citizen's map, that's great and we can all agree on, that's the best case scenario, because I'm gonna be honest, what court's gonna throw out a citizen's map? Um, and that's what you gotta drive at, public input, um, figure out the best way to do things, the most transparent and open way, and explain to the, the general public, like any map we do, people are gonna be mad about. There's gonna be splits somewhere. That's the reality. You need to go back and say, we're splitting it because of, purely partisan gerrymandering, population, contingent, like there, there's, there's reasons why you do stuff and you have to explain why you're doing it. That's how you get past the partisanship and focus on the policy and building districts that people want that bring them together rather than divide them. That was a good ending. And since nobody asked my awesome questions. Um, Thank you so much, Representative Grove. That was incredibly enlightening. It answered a lot of questions I think a lot of us have about that process. So thank you. And thank you for being so transparent. We appreciate your years of service for our state house. In honor of uh, Representative Grove, we are presenting the book dig uh, by A.S. King, which will go to our students of the month to take back to York Country Day. And as promised at this time, I would like to invite Leanne Wilson to the podium to introduce our students of the month. And they're going to talk quick. Hi, I'm Leanne Wilson. I joined Rotary in May and I am the newest member of the Youth Leadership Committee. Those that know me know I typically jump in to help out um, and being first for the students of the month recognition didn't phase me. I kind of regret that. But so nine o'clock last night is when I realized I probably had a little more to do than coordinating with the students and the school, greeting the families and taking a picture. Thankfully, Kevin responded early this morning, giving me a template, so I knew that I had to do the introductions. So his template had a quote, and I knew what quote I wanted, but I didn't have time to find the facts, so I'm not sure if it's Lucille Ball or Benjamin Franklin. But the quote is, if you want, if you want something done, ask a busy person to do it. The more things you can do, the more you can do. I've kind of lived that in my life, and I'm sure all of our students of the month do as well. They take on more to achieve their goals, and today is no exception to that. The students here with us today are juniors from the York Country Day School. Today is also the National Testing Day for the PSATs, 
So they spent their morning taking the test, which was delayed, delaying them. They did a quick Superman and Superwoman change so that they look professional <laughs> and they were whisked up the hill by their parents. So thank you to the parents, always ready um, to get your children where they need to go for their activities. We're glad that you could join us. So for the introductions, Colin Masick, like I said, is a junior at your country day school and is the son of Jessica and James Masick. In school, he is the captain of the varsity soccer team, part of the International Thespian Society, headmaster's advisory, student ambassador, and honor council. Outside of school, he continues his love of soccer by being a referee and coach. He also enjoys sound design and journal journalism. In the future, he plans to attend college to study political science with the goal of being in politics um, or pursuing law school. Sydney Ruddesill is a junior and is the daughter of Rebecca and Christopher Ruddesill. In school, she's also on the varsity soccer team, part of the upper school musical yearbook club, mini thon club, International Thespian Society and Honor Council. Outside of school, she is active in soccer, basketball, golf, piano, vocal lessons, theater, aviation, and she works as a pharmaceutical technician. Remember I said, you do more, you can get more. In the, plan, in the future, she plans to attend college to major in biochemistry or molecular biology with the goal of being a clinical molecular geneticist. So Rotarians, please help me welcome Colin and Sydney to the podium to say a few words. Good afternoon, Rotarians, leaders of York, friends, family. It's an honor to be afforded this opportunity to be named as one of October Students of the Month for the Rotary Club of York. I'd like to begin with a story. After deciding to pursue a chance to play collegiate soccer, I decided to try out for an elite level team, much more competitive than the team I was on at the time. It's about 2020, right before the pandemic. The coach told me I was not good enough and to come back. I was, at least to say, devastated. For years, I had been consistently a star on the field. Now I found myself at rock bottom. I decided to examine my areas of weakness and work day by day during quarantine to repair my technique and get back to the best shape of my life. Countless hours were spent in the backyard, in between Zoom classes, working out after the sun had gone down, all to reach my goal. In the end, it was successful. I made the team during the summer tryouts. Failure is essential to the life I want to live. It's simple, but only on the surface. Think for a second, when was the last time you failed and how did you recover? Considering that you're all our, um, all our respected local leaders and Rotarians, I anticipate that your answers may be similar to my methodology. As a student athlete, I live through failure every single day. It may be that I fail to be the captain and leader that my team needs on that day, or that I do worse on a test than I had anticipated. It's at these times where I've found there are two options. One, you can decide to settle for mediocrity and not learn from your mistakes, repeating an endless cycle of failure until you decide to take option two. Option two, of course, is the choice to examine your failures and actively work to find a solution to the issues that cause them. I live and breathe by this methodology. The process, the struggle to make this choice each day is what guides me. In fact, I believe that this process has been what continues to propel me towards success and excellence in everything that I do. To bring this full circle, I have to mention two of the most important figures in the history of soccer. You may know Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. Both players are indisputably the most successful of all time, but there's a key difference between them. Messi played in Barcelona's academy over in Spain from the age of 13, while it took Ronaldo until the age of 18 to play for Manchester United over in England. It's argued by many that while Messi is more talented, Ronaldo is the harder, harder worker. The stats and accolades, uh, they speak for Ronaldo in nearly all cases. So I'm not here to dispute who's better, but without failure and desire to improve, Ronaldo would have been just another player who never made it. He put it best when he said, quote, I feel the endless need to learn, to improve, to evolve, not only to please the coach and the fans, but also to feel satisfied with myself, end quote. 
it is this principle of failure, which leads to hard work, that is my motivation to be the best possible version of myself. Thank you. Good afternoon. For my entire life, people have been telling me that when I get older, the years are going to fly by like that. My name is Sydney Rudisil. I'm 16 years old, and let me tell you, I was not expecting it to happen so soon. For most of my life, it seemed like being an adult was so far away. I wasn't prepared in the slightest, but I was excited to go to college and to start driving and to do all of those adult things. A few months ago, though, I realized how close all of that actually was. For example, I got my driver's license this year, I've started going to college visits, and I'm turning 18 years old in 2022. Wow. We live in a competitive world, one that requires us to go above and beyond in all that we do. So I began overloading my schedule in hopes of accomplishing as much as possible in as little time as possible, as we've heard. <laughs> I now have to keep up with schoolwork, honors classes, college classes, sports, theater, piano, college prep. And on top of all of that, I had to get a job because as we all know, gasoline sure is not cheap. Almost everything that we do in life prepares us for the next step. To put it bluntly, elementary school prepares us for middle school, prepares us for high school, prepares us for college, prepares us for a career, prepares us for retirement. I've reached an age where I'm stuck in the middle of childhood and adulthood. I'm, I'm trying to prepare myself for the future while also trying to savor the last bit of my teenage life. Recently, I've been spending any spare moment with my friends before we graduate and it's still not enough. Time moves incredibly fast and in a few years, my entire life is going to be different. I'm not ready to let go of my childhood. I focused on the question, what do you want to be when you grow up for so long? And I'm lucky because I actually do know the answer. I plan to go to college and to study biochemistry in hopes of working with genetics. I've always had a set plan with my life and I've worked to achieve all of my goals for the future. So now I like to ask myself another question. What do you want to do with the time that you have right now? I believe that regardless of what stage you're at in life, that time deserves to be savored because each stage of life brings new opportunities. As I'm reaching the end of my childhood, I want to live in the present and to savor every moment before I move on to my next step. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney and Colin, you certainly were worth waiting for. Our future is in very, very bright hands. We wish you continued success with your education, both of you. Next week, we will hear from our Rotary Foundation Committee Chair, Bill Hartman, and President-elect nominee, Aaron Jacobs, who will talk to us about the great initiatives um, in our Rotary Foundation through Rotary International, as well as what we're doing locally. And Bill Hartman will share a really great new idea about earning your Paul Harris Fellow that I think you'll find really interesting and beneficial. In closing today, I'd just like to share with you, and before I do, just want to tell you that Representative Grove has agreed to stay with us. There were so many good questions I know that you still want to have answered. He'll stay for a few minutes to answer those after our meeting, and I thank you for, for staying with us. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Abraham Lincoln. Rotarians, I hope you have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next week. This meeting is adjourned.